Conventional wisdom holds that since his abrupt displacement by Kamala Harris, Joe Biden has faded into irrelevance. Not so. There's four months left in the administration. And we're going to keep running through the tape. In person, Mr. Biden may walk like old man Mose, but following his once-a-year cabinet meeting, this is the presidential reality. He will direct his cabinet to get as much work done as possible. His advisor explained. Whether that is moving funding out the door, announcing new programs or policies, or delivering on programs and policies we've already announced. Mr. Biden may have evaporated, but the federal bureaucracy he directs has not. Other than protecting the integrity of the Supreme Court, one of the most important issues in the 2024 presidential campaign is what either candidate would do with the vast powers of the regulatory bureaucracy. I think we should eliminate the filibuster for Roe and get us to the point where we 51 votes would be what we need to actually put back in law the protections for reproductive freedom. Today, it's becoming clearer that the Democratic left's recent assault on the Supreme Court's legitimacy arguably is more about regulation than abortion. What we are talking about is a simple procedure to allow whenever rights are taken away from someone that the U.S. Senate can, without without being blocked by a filibuster, be able to restore those rights. The Dobbs decision affected one admittedly significant thing, abortion. But the court's Loper decision in June was about virtually everything else. The problem that Loper fixes isn't a problem of legislation that's too vague or ambiguous or otherwise inadequate. In my view, in recent years, especially with this administration, we have agencies whose leaders have decided they've got an agenda that they're pursuing. They're not there to impartially implement the laws that pertain to their jurisdiction. Rather, they're there to implement a particular agenda. They hire very capable, very creative attorneys to go out and justify somehow what it is that they want to do. And I think that's true at the FTC. I think that's true at the CFPB. I think that's been true at the SEC. The Loper decision overruled a 40-year-old Supreme Court precedent called Chevron deference asserting that federal judges generally should defer to the expertise of bureaucracies. It was the most powerful federal tool the left had to organize society according to its social and policy preferences. The Chevron deference largely allowed them to both implement these sometimes, I think, very creatively justified rules and then be the judge that decides whether or not they did it properly. The Harris campaign knows that aggressive regulation has become unpopular. That's why, since evolving into her party's presidential candidacy, Ms. Harris has reversed many of her positions. There's no question I'm in favor of banning fracking. And that was 2019. Here's the presidential hopeful today in one of the few interviews she's given. Do you still want to ban fracking? No, and I made that clear on the debate stage in 2020. Ms. Harris also claims not to support an electric vehicle mandate. Both are examples of regulation on steroids, rules that directly affect thousands of individuals. My values have not changed. Suddenly in 2024, we have a Democratic candidate insisting repeatedly that she won't carry out her progressive party's most sought-after regulatory goals. The reason, of course, is significant numbers of people don't want these rules dumped on them, most pointedly in must-win Pennsylvania. I will get Pennsylvania energy workers pumping, fracking, drilling, and producing like never before. Fracking, as Mr. Trump knows, delivers the, quote, good-paying middle-class jobs Ms. Harris claims to care about. It has been an economic boon for western Pennsylvania and eastern Ohio, areas formerly left for dead. They say that if you win Pennsylvania, you're going to win the whole thing. Ms. Harris' abandonment of her party's regulation priorities is transparent opportunism and surely temporary. In contrast, Donald Trump has made reducing federal regulation a central element of his campaign, as it was in practice during his first term. I will launch a historic campaign to liberate our economy from crippling regulation. We will eliminate a minimum of 10 old regulations for every one new regulation. We'll be able to do that quite easily, actually. 
As president, Ronald Reagan appointed the Grace Commission in 1982 to, in his words, drain the swamp of bureaucratic inefficiency. Mr. Trump says he'll assign Elon Musk to a similar Mission Impossible. These 2,478 cost-cutting, revenue-enhancing recommendations cannot only significantly reduce the size of our federal deficit, but can be achieved without raising taxes, without weakening America's needed defense buildup, without in any way harming necessary social welfare programs, and finally, without the need to further study opportunities to cut costs and reduce the deficit. We'll see. Mr. Trump lately has been doing Harris-like flopping around on economics, not least his ever-expanding tax and tariff proposals. But rather than focus on that, Kamala Harris constantly and falsely accuses Mr. Trump of planning to implement a 900-page document called Project 2025 to transform the government. But her boss has already completed his version of that project. According to calculations by the American Action Forum, which monitors federal regulations, the projected cost of the Biden administration's finalized rules so far is a record $1.68 trillion. That compares with total cost in the Obama years of $327 billion. Ms. Harris surely has her own Project 2025, reducible to a single sentence. Make the federal government bigger than even Joe Biden's historic bureaucratic expansion, if you can imagine that.